You've probably heard the hype about semaglutide or Ozempic and the GLP-1 agonist drugs, but have you heard about the GLP-1 probiotics? There's been a lot of new claims in the supplement industry around the creation of these GLP-1 probiotics. Now, inside today's episode, I'm gonna dive into what exactly this means. We'll talk a little bit about the science of probiotics and briefly touch on uh, some of the elements of GLP-1. Now, anytime we're talking about probiotics and gut health, understand that the science of the microbiome is very trendy, very new, but we do still have research and evidence to fall back on and certain ways that we may be able to substantiate certain claims, whereas other things might be a little bit of a stretch when it comes to the truth and what we know so far in terms of the gut and our ability to lose weight or improve body composition by uh, modifying or modulating the gut microbiome. So you might be thinking, okay, GLP-1 probiotic, do I just pop this pill, I'm gonna take this probiotic and all of a sudden I'm gonna start losing weight and the fat's gonna melt away. Well, if it sounds too good to be true, it's probably because it is. Now, if you consume content in the health and fit industry online, you've probably seen some of these targeted ads. I've personally been one to receive them. I've also had a lot of people send them to me and ask questions in my DMs. If you're not following, I'm at Sam Miller Science on Instagram and just about every major platform Sam Miller on YouTube and the Sam Miller Science Podcast if you're listening on audio. And what you'll notice is a lot of times the strain that's specifically being referenced, at least when I'm seeing these targeted ads, is acromancia. So with acromancia, the current marketing would have you believe that you're gonna get weight loss results similar to a pharmaceutical like a GLP-1, which is a glucagon-like peptide. And uh, you know, brand name, think Ozempic and Manjaro, those have kind of been the most popular ones. So today I'm specifically addressing the hype around acromancia specifically and these GLP-1 probiotics. Now first, I think it makes sense to examine acromancia's role within the gut and also kind of break down some of the claims that are put forth by uh, some of the internet marketing. After that, we'll address you know some of the claims that were made about uh, other probiotics related to weight loss and fat loss, but acromancia definitely being a big one. So first we'll talk about its role in the gut and then can acromancia in and of itself produce these changes, really how we're gonna break down today's episode. So let's dive in. First, you know, let's talk about acromancia just as, uh, as it exists within the gut microbiota. Because even if you're not necessarily taking this GLP-1 probiotic, uh, acromancia is still very much a thing. So acromancia is a particular strain of bacteria that resides in our gut lining and is one of the primary strains of bacteria that keep the mucus layer of the gut healthy. Now, you might be thinking, if you're not super familiar with gut health, you're like, mucus layer, what is that? Um, that's actually totally normal, and so acromancia is already uh, a constituent component of that, very important part of that. Now, basically, these companies are marketing this strain, hoping to you know, buy in and get a lot of attention from consumers, thinking that it's going to deliver uh, these rapid body composition changes. So acromancia is that strain of bacteria. And what it does is it actually degrades the mucus and uh, promotes the formation of new mucus, which maybe sounds gross if you're listening to this, but in reality, it's kind of just a natural process that's happening uh, inside the gut. And it's important to consider when we're addressing some of these claims that these internet marketers are making as we move through the show. So why is the mucus layer important? As much as it sounds a little bit weird, a healthy mucus layer is absolutely necessary for maintaining the integrity of your gut lining and the tight junctions of your gut. So if someone had like lower acromancia per se, that might be one of those situations where these very same internet marketers would be kind of targeting you with messaging related to leaky gut, right? Or intestinal permeability. So acromancia or you know specifically this entire healthy mucus layer is actually helping to prevent leaky gut. The mucus layer also creates a healthy separation between the gut immune system and the gut microbiome. So once the mucus layer begins to degrade, which happens whenever we're eating a lower fiber diet or like standard American diet of sorts, you know, highly processed foods, um, not necessarily our single ingredient whole foods that are micronutrient dense, this allows the microbiome to get dangerously close to the gut immune system. This can ultimately lead to the immune system generating inflammatory responses. And then this can either kill off some of our gut bugs and result in a generally dysbiotic state or some, some situation where we're having an overgrowth of what's called opportunistic bacteria. 
And you know, typically what we're wanting is more of that commensal bacteria. So commensal bacteria is good bacteria. And you'll hear people kind of talk about this casually online as like good gut bugs and kind of bad gut bugs. Really what they're talking about is the commensal versus opportunistic strains. Now, in addition to that, acromancia produces short chain fatty acids. You may have seen this online as SCFAs. Also promotes the production of GLP-1, both of which are satiety signals as well as helping significantly with insulin sensitivity. So this is where people are making that GLP-1 claim is because of acromancia's involvement in the production of short chain fatty acids. With that background information kind of out of the way and knowing a little bit of the science, and again, I have tons and tons of audio episodes on gut health specifically, if you're looking to check that out, also a number of diagrams, uh, both on my Sam Miller Science Instagram and the Metabolism School Instagram account. If you're not following, check that out uh, to learn a little bit more. But what we'll see is the claims in this marketing are largely low levels of acromancia are associated with poor health. Now, yes, lower levels of acromancia have been associated with obesity and type two diabetes, but let's think about that. What is maybe causing the type two diabetes and maybe progression towards an obese state is largely the person's diet and exercise, right? So there's lifestyle components that are driving this and contributing to the changes in the gut microbiota. So this is when people are talking about acromancia being associated with type two diabetes or obesity, you know, now they're gonna say, well, if I have higher levels, then I can move in the opposite direction of obesity, right? That's kind of the logic that they're using for these claims. But this is only half the story when we're thinking about uh, always wanting you know, super high levels of acromancia, right? A lot of times when it comes to the gut, it's really more about balance versus like super high or super low levels. And it's all relative to other strains of bacteria. So remember how I said earlier that acromancia keeps mucus healthy and it basically degrades it and promotes that turnover of healthy mucus. Well, when we have uh, overgrowths that kind of tip the balance of what's going on um, in terms of the gut, basically degrading the mucus layer more than recovering it, we actually end up having gut inflammation. So you don't want too much degradation, you want kind of that sweet spot, right? A lot of things when it comes to gut health and hormones is kind of like that Goldilocks amount, having that sort of in between versus having ramped up degradation or you know low acromancia, which is more so associated with type two diabetes and obesity. So as with most strains, we just want a good balance in the gut, not too high or too low. Note that this is not uh, me saying inside today's episode that taking an acromancia probiotic is going to increase the risk of disease. It likely won't, um, just like taking an acromancia probiotic likely won't lead to longer term increases in acromancia in a stool test. Mainly just giving you this information to say that higher or more isn't always better, right? There's something to be said for kind of like minimum effective dose attitude related to some things in health and fitness you know, versus just kind of having that gung-ho mentality with everything. The main claim that I want to address with acromancia is how it's being talked about specifically related to insulin sensitivity and being a miracle probiotic and even being touted as like a GLP-1 probiotic, which is a little bit of a stretch. The short of it is that the marketing is way ahead of the data. And that's typically what tends to happen in the supplement space, uh, having that marketing out of the data. So acromancia might be better than some current probiotics for this. Notice I said some current probiotics based on the research we have, but the current data does not really say that or support that. So as of the recording of this podcast in 2024, there is one single clinical trial on basically consumer formulations of acromancia available. One single trial. So that's not to say that there's you know no evidence because there is one trial, but one trial isn't necessarily something we want to write home about compared to the fact that we have some strains that have way more evidence or have been thoroughly studied uh, related to some of the claims that are made in marketing. If we compare this to something like uh, lactobacillus or the bifidobacterium family, when we see these probiotic blends, we have hundreds of studies and that leads to a substantial level of evidence to feel confident supplementing with these particular strains. So if you were to take the acromancia probiotic trial that we had as an example and uh, we also have meta-analysis of 30 different trials of lacto-bifido blends in terms of metabolic health. There's some interesting data that I think might surprise you. So let's use A1C as an example. So this is a three month average of your blood glucose levels. And if we were to just follow this particular data point and look at acromancia versus the lacto-bifido, 
you'd start to understand why we want to question this whole GLP-1 probiotic kind of stretched marketing in a way. Now, if you only looked at the abstracts of the two studies, you'd think that acromancia is mildly better. But when you actually dive into the data, the acromancia showed a lowering of A1C of 0.6 whereas in the meta-analysis of lactobifido blends, there was a lowering of A1C of 0.4. But remember, 30 different trials included that lactobifido blend. So that's a lot of data. That's a large volume of trials, uh, larger sample sizes, you know, more people and data being reviewed to come to uh, that particular statistic. So the number I quoted is an average of all of them. And if you likely dig into the A1C lowering of each trial, what you'll see is one trial had a lowering of up to 1.1, which actually is in excess of the acromancia at 0.6. So if we were to cherry pick data, you could manipulate the marketing around a lacto bifido blend to say that it's also improving insulin sensitivity. Maybe that's going to help with weight loss, right? So the average lowering ended up being 0.4, but we had as high as 1.1 or even 0.9. You know, the lower end was like 0 0.3, 0 0.4, and so it averaged out um, versus the acromancia was only one trial at the 0.6. So in other words, you know, if you wanna be like a fitness fraud in the way that you're marketing, you can kind of cherry pick that data to support your argument. Again, I think it's good when we're using clinical trials or human evidence to support our supplement claims, but, always being a savvy consumer, or if you're a coach or health professional making supplement recommendations to clients, you need to understand where uh, some of this is coming from or if the claims are really founded or not. In addition to that, insulin sensitivity as measured by HOMA IR, which is another marker, did not change in the Acromancia study. Whereas in the uh, multiple studies that we saw related to lacto bifido blend, you do see significant improvements in those HOMA IR metrics. So again, marketing a little bit ahead of the data. I appreciate what they're trying to do here. I'm not anti-probiotics. I I'm definitely pro probiotics or situationally pro probiotics, depending on the person's health. So probiotics can be great after someone's been administered antibiotics or for generally supporting gut health. There are certain conditions where there's pretty solid evidence to support the use of a probiotic, probiotic being good for just general gut immune health. Um, certainly a supplement you could consider, and there's definitely evidence to support a probiotic, but when you see some of these sensationalized claims related to acromantia, and especially being compared to a powerful drug like a GLP-1, it is a little bit too much in my opinion. So I don't want you to think that this is me completely writing off acromantia. I'm not anti-acromantia, I'm just anti people claiming that acromantia is the GLP-1 of probiotics. I don't think we actually know that yet or have the data to basically support its use at that level, nor can it really replace the pharmacology of something you know like GLP-1. So what I basically wanna do with this episode is just kind of cut through a little bit of the sensationalized marketing and make sure that we're understanding where the marketers are coming from, the supplement formulators, but then also what's being said in the research and evidence and what should we actually do as consumers. So it may down the road uh, turn out to be a major probiotic to take for metabolic health. I'm not ruling that out. It's not to say that after many more trials, maybe we do see you know, higher uh, level improvements of A1C in terms of that total change. Maybe we do see change in HOMA IR. Maybe there's body composition change and so much more, but I think right now it's too early to tell based off of one trial. Is it trending the right direction? Yes, but that doesn't mean it's fair to make a comparison to a very strong pharmaceutical agent in GLP-1, which we've certainly seen um, being kind of running rampant uh, across the internet right now, at least in my sphere of the social media space, uh, space of what I see. So last thing I wanna mention is there are natural ways to increase acromancy in the gut through your diet, lifestyle, things like exercise. So polyphenol consumption from fruits and vegetables can increase acromancia. A higher fiber diet has been shown to do this over time. And exercise also tends to lead to an increase in acromancia. So acromancia might be looked at as a proxy for health in general or metabolic health in general and trending in the right direction in terms of our metabolism, just overall health status. Acromancia probiotics are new and they're certainly interesting. I think anytime there's a novel supplement, it certainly catches my eye and I'm always open to exploring it further. I think in the future, we may know more about this and more people may want to jump on it. For the time being, understand that a lot of this is being based off of that one trial and we do have other probiotics that have just as much, if not more evidence to support their use. And so we can still be a fan of probiotics. We can still be all about 
probiotic supplementation. It just means, you know, right now, especially given some of the markup on these, do you need to go out of your way to specifically buy Acromancia? I don't know if it's necessary at this time, there might be another way to do it. So I'm looking forward to seeing when more research comes out, certainly something I'd be open to trying or experimenting in the future. I always like to test out different evidence-based supplements, but for now, I don't think we need to go there just yet. You can save your hard-earned dollars. And uh, if you are looking for evidence-based supplements, I've got a myriad of different podcasts on kind of your ultimate guide to different micronutrients, things like creatine, protein, and ways to include evidence-based supplementation to support your goals. If you enjoyed this episode and this science-based breakdown of Acromancia and the general marketing of the GLP-1 probiotics, please share the show. If you enjoyed it, if it entertained you, pass the time, give you some good information, or you plan to use this to talk to your clients or create content, or if it helped you make your own decisions around supplementation, please share it. The chances are you found the show because someone either shared it with you directly, they posted it online, or they left a rating and review. And when you leave those ratings and reviews, it kind of tells the algorithm to signal other listeners, other viewers, that this is good information and good content that can be beneficial. So please pay it forward. Remember, uh, one of my original listeners is likely the reason you made it to me in the first place. And without your help, it becomes very, very difficult uh, to grow the show, especially with the type of health and lifestyle information that we're talking about. It's not always something... Um, than necessarily is uh, encouraged or promoted as much as maybe some of the uh, fad material that's out there, right? So when, when you're talking about things that are a little bit more research-based uh, or you're talking about things that are more preventive medicine versus Western medicine, that doesn't always necessarily uh, get that same kind of spotlight in the algorithm. So you guys uh, help to really share that and get that out there with the world so this can continue to uh, encourage the ripple effect that comes from coaching and all of the positives that come from having great information to use for our health, fitness, and nutrition. I appreciate you guys. Thanks so much for tuning into today's show, and I'll talk to you in the next episode.